Hello, all you beautiful people out there, and welcome. If you're new, thank you for stopping by. Why don't you go down, hit the subscribe button, and ring the bell so you don't miss any content. For my fans and subscribers, welcome back. I really do appreciate you. Today, I'm going to be talking about the reception of the book of Daniel. Not much else I need to say. Let's get on with the video. While your mind is on it, if you have not subscribed, go ahead and click that subscribe button. And if you have subscribed, make sure you're still subscribed because for some reason YouTube sometimes unsubscribes people. So, you know, make sure you're subscribed. Also, please remember that I now offer memberships. You can become a member for as little as 99 cents a month. Just hit the join button and it will take you to the join page. Thank you in advance. A major problem for the interpretation is Daniel's service to Babylon. This generally comes from his wish that the king prosper, which was something the Jews definitely did not want. This prompted some Jews to ask if Daniel was helping an idolater. Some even went as far as to claim that God sent him to the lion's den as punishment for disloyalty. Other rabbis defend Daniel, interpreting the advice he gave to Nebuchadnezzar as only out of concern for his people, because he knew that Babylon would be defeated in the end. Others agree that his intentions were good, but his actions were bad. Christians, however, tend to think more from the perspective of the ruler than the diaspora. They use Daniel 4 as a way to say that God guides secular rulers and the image of a repentant ruler, i.e. Nebuchadnezzar, became especially important after Constantine. Many apologists, including Augustine, thought that Nebuchadnezzar's conversion foreshadowed Constantine's supposed conversion. I do not think for one minute that Constantine actually converted. I think it was a political move. And his life afterward affirms that. Eastern Christendom makes the link between Nebuchadnezzar and Christianity quite strongly. In Armenia, for example, we find a story about 5th century pagan king who got knocked off his chariot and possessed by a demon. According to the story, Gregory the Illuminator helped the king recover and the king converted. He then Christianized his kingdom. I need to point out that when the book of Daniel was written, even though it was written a lot later, than it's purported to have been written, Christianity did not exist. So, I'm not quite sure of the point. Christians interpreted these later kings and emperors to be types of Nebuchadnezzar, which in turn made them more comfortable with the concept of Christendom. I will say, does that really matter? In those days, disobeying the king almost certainly meant death. Islamic traditions also interpret Nebuchadnezzar's story. To them, his animal-like state served to warn kings. However, their traditions also state that the king got angry when the youths refused to eat the impure meat of the king and threw them into the lion's den. Of course, this story is an amalgam of several stories from Daniel 1 to 6, but they are still recognizable. In this faith, the story serves as a warning. God will intervene if you threaten his servants. 
some people thought the text speaks to rulers more generally. A Jewish rabbi thought Isaiah 14, 4 through 20 about an anonymous king should be understood by way of context in light of Daniel 4. He implies that this is what God has in store for all political leaders. During the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, Christians discussed sovereignty in a different light, especially if their denomination conflicted with the ruler. Martin Luther wrote that Nebuchadnezzar's punishment should comfort Christians who suffer injustice. At the same time, Luther urged Christians to submit to the tyrants because in the end, God would take care of them. This most likely was to appease the powers that be because of the revolt of Thomas Munzer. Calvin also shared the same views. Other Christians used this story to critique secular rulers. Some even tried to connect the quote-unquote madness of Nebuchadnezzar with mental illnesses of their then-present rulers. For example, George III of England started his battle with mental illness in 1788, and the American colonists used this for propaganda. Still, other interpreters noted that justice, particularly economic justice, appeared in Daniel 4. Daniel suggests that giving to the poor and uplifting the oppressed may appease God, and therefore the king would not be punished. Christians and Jews alike point out that God does not directly care for the poor and needy. Okay, why not? Surely he could, right? Instead, the, these teachers point out that the spiritual and redemptive qualities that caring for the poor gives us. But if we don't give to the poor, somebody's going to die. Why should someone die just because somebody's too lazy to do what God wants them to do? It doesn't make any sense. And for that matter, if God is God, like I said, why didn't he just feed the poor himself? During the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, both sides debated works and salvation using Daniel 4. In the 1600s, the reformer named John Mayer taught that Daniel's advice teaches us to be charitable and that nobody is a true convert without this quality of charity. Other reformers, such as Swiss theologian Heinrich Bullinger, felt that Daniel 4.27 should be interpreted as advice for ruling an empire instead of personal salvation. According to him, this should be seen as advice to establish justice as a way of prolonging the empire. Well, friends, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button, press the subscribe button, and if you want to know when I come out with new content, hit the bell next to the subscribe button. All social media links are in the description. Also, the source that I used for this episode is in the description. Also, if you would, please share this. That is, if you think it's worth sharing, I would very much appreciate it. Keep learning and searching for truth. Here are a few videos from my library. If you have not watched them yet, Go ahead and watch them and tell me what you think. Also, I'm always up for uh, constructive criticism. If you have any ideas on how I can improve my channel, please let me know. 
A big thank you to my members. If you would like to be on this list, remember, click the join button. You can join for as little as 99 cents a month. Have a great day, everyone, and goodbye.